or the Christmas spirit. In other words, they're going to sit there and say, you know, that Christmas is pagan, that we shouldn't celebrate it, that we shouldn't do it as a pagan holiday, and they're going to give you all these reasons, you know, which are reasons that are not really all that many. There's like one or two that, that they can possibly go to, but this morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments about is Christmas pagan? Are they actually correct? Are they right in this? You know, should we actually be celebrating Christmas or should we just say, you know, we'll just, we'll just treat this as, a, a, you know, just a regular day throughout the year? And so some of you are already shaking your head and everything else, you know, we'll see where this goes, right? All right. So in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, you know, what we want to do, you know, uh, I'm trying to set you know, the stage on this because what it says here, it says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days. And so what we see in here, like I say, over the past few years, I've even noticed this, especially over like Facebook. I haven't been on Facebook for a couple years, but when I was on there, this was starting, and it seemed to be kind of getting some steam. Like more people were saying, oh yeah, Christmas is pagan. We shouldn't you know, celebrate it. But there's a small group of people that are trying to do away with or call into question Christmas, and they call it a pagan holiday. What do I mean by pagan? That it's not Christian. That it's not a Christian holiday, that, we, you know, that, we're, that we're worshiping some other gods and everything else because of the fact that we're doing this. And you know what, before I know that you, you know, some of you are going to go like, you know, that's dumb, stupid, whatever. We're going to go through you know, some, of those, some of the arguments that they bring up. The first one is this. Are Christmas trees bad? Are they pagan? Because they will use... They will use, uh, you know, uh, different verses, you know, everything else to try and prove their point. And where do they get this from is if you flip over to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, this is where they will take you. And they will automatically, but I'm going to show you through the, uh, through the Word of God what the Bible says about Christmas trees. You say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about Christmas trees. Yeah, it does. It does, in a sense, it does. All right. Let's look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Let's start at verse 1 and read through verse 5. It says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the, ways, uh, the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and uh, they fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. That's the big part right there. They're going to say right there, that's it. You're not supposed to do it. Verse 5 says, They are upright as the, uh, as the palm tree, but speak not. They, uh, they must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is, uh, is it in them to do good. So as you read that, they'll read verses 4, and they'll say, you'll see right there, it says, if you go and you cut down a tree, and some of you, I know how some of you are very, very literal, and some of you are going, well, I didn't cut down my tree. Mine's a fake tree. I just bought it at Lowe's. So I'm not cutting down any trees. I'm not bringing it in. But, you know, the whole thing is, is that that's a custom of, of, of Christmas, is that you have a tree in your house, right? There's no other time of the year you never bring a tree in your house. Well, I mean, I guess unless it's a small tree, but you don't bring a big evergreen tree or whatever it is into your house. And so they'll say, well, see right there, it talks about that you cannot cut down a tree, that that's a sin. And the fact that you're decking it with silver and gold, those are ornament, you know, ornaments and everything else, that that's what we need. You know, we don't need a Christmas tree. It's pagan. We don't need to do it. And they're like, end of the discussion. But they don't read the rest of the chapter. Because if we were to look at this and go through it, for one thing, let's look at verses 8 and 9. All right? 8 and 9 says, But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from uh, uh, Euphaz, the, uh, the work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is uh, their clothing, and they are all the work of cunning. Well, so in other words, what is, let's look at this. What is he talking about? What is, this, what is this entire chapter speaking of? Well, let's go through a few things. The fact of it says that they deck it with silver and gold. Do you know what deck means? It means to cover. It means to literally, like, you know, cover. If you have a deck, what does it do? It covers the ground, right? 
When we sing the song, deck the halls with boughs of holly, some of you go, I don't even know what that means. It means that you're, you're covering the, hall, you know, the halls of your house like with holly and everything else. You're getting in the mood, like with garland and everything else. Like you're covering it literally. So that's what it means. Okay, so if we look at this and the fact that in verse 9 it talks about a founder. A founder is a person that pours metal or glass and molds it into an image. He is speaking of idols. He is talking about the fact that they go off into the forest. They cut down a tree. They begin to carve the tree into an idol. They have it overlaid with gold or silver or both. And they have this idol. Now, do you pour metal over your tree, your Christmas tree? Do you carve it? Well, the chainsaw, no, we're not talking about the chainsaw cutting it down. But do you do that? No, you're not making an idol, all right? For one thing, um, you know, uh, so when we look at this, the, the entire chapter, the entire, you know, the words throughout, the entire subject matter in this entire chapter is talking about idols. It's not talking about you cutting down a tree and you decorating it for Christmas. Decking also is the fact, you, like I say, you, you deck it, you cover, you, know, you cover your halls, you deck the halls, right? You're not, nowhere does it say you're hanging gold or silver. Because they'll say, the, you know, the gold or the silver, are, that's the ornaments. It's like you're not decking it, you're hanging ornaments on there. And so what we see through this whole thing, and in verse 3 it talks about, it says, the customs of the people are vain and vanity. Why? Because, because of the fact that it is, that they're talking about idols, that they're cutting down a tree for idols. And it says, you know, uh, that they're cutting it down, that, that, they're, that they're carving it, they're uh, making it into an idol, and then they're covering it with gold and silver, that, that they think can walk and talk and do anything you know, besides just sit there. But we know... As Christians, idols are nothing like the one true God. Idols are nothing like the one true God. Why? Because there are no, if we look at what the Bible says, there is no, uh, there are no other gods before him. There are no other gods. All idols are dead. No idols were, no idols can, uh, you know, were ever able to give you know, birth or anything else. They're not alive. They don't talk. They don't do anything. Our God is the one true God, right? Amen. And so what we see here you know, uh, through this is, is that later on in the chapter, graven images and molten images are vain, and that's why he's calling them vanity. We see this in verses 9 and 14. Verse 9 says, uh, and I talked about this one a little bit earlier, it says, silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz, the gold of the workman and of the hands of the fo- uh, founder. So we, you say, well, how do you know that he's talking about idols? Well, for one thing, like I said, he talks about the, fi- uh, the founder. The founder does these things. You carve it, he does what? He pours, he, he molten, he melts the metal over it, Okay. We see this in verse 14. Throughout this entire chapter, it talks about these things. Verse 14, every man is brutish in their knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten uh, molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. He's telling us that there's no breath, there's no life. They can't walk, they can't talk, they can't do anything. All it is is just sitting around collecting dust. And it's funny that it says that every founder is confounded by the graven image which means that they are perplexed, dismayed. Why? Because it doesn't answer them. They're, and it says, uh, it also means to put to shame and silence that they are astonished. Why? Because, like I said, it's not alive. It's never going to answer any prayer. It's never going to do anything. So you have all these different places, like you have like the Catholic Church, you have Buddhists, you have all these different religions out there that have statues and idols in there, and they can't answer any of their prayers. None of them. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and I know I'm not, doesn't the Bible teach against graven images? Isn't it one of the Ten Commandments? Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, Thou shalt not make any, uh, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is uh, in the earth be- uh, beneath or that is in the water under 
uh, under the earth. So he's telling us not to make graven images. That's what they're doing. What does graven mean? It means to engrave, carve. That that's what they're doing. What does molten mean? It's melt, uh, melting, to melt down metal, to pour it over an object. We, and this is exactly what we see throughout this. There's a continuity of thought that keeps on going uh, through this entire chapter. Because this is the main chapter that they will go to, Jeremiah 10. And they will quote those two verses to you and say, see, right there, you cut down a tree, you're putting you know, those gold and silver pagan uh, you know, ornaments over them, you're just worshiping the tree. Right? That's what, you know, they'll sit there and tell you, you say, well, pastor, I've never had that happen. It will. You're going to have somebody come up to you that is supposedly a super Christian. They're not going to read the full chapter. They're going to read those two things, take it out of context, and, and, and completely, um, you, know, uh, you know, miss the whole thing. The evergreen tree is also, you know, if we look at an evergreen tree or anything else, it's supposed to represent what? Eternal life. The gift that we receive because Jesus Christ came and it was born unto us, right? All these things, what do we place underneath the tree? Gifts, presents. Why? Because we receive the greatest present. We receive the greatest gift in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Just to make it clear, it is not a sin to cut down a tree. It is Either that or Delta Tree Company, I need to talk to him because he goes out there and cuts down all these trees. He's sinning all over the place. Well, then they'll say, and, and the you know, people in this argument, they'll, they'll sit there and you explain that to them. You show them in there and they'll say, well, what the pagans used to do. And this is what they, you, know, you do around Christmas time. Is these pagans would decorate the inside of their homes with greenery and bring in trees inside of the house. Even greenery is pagan to them. Okay? That tree is not causing me to sin, I'll just tell you that right now. That greenery, that none of this in here is why? Because God created it. I'm not bowing down to it. I'm not worshiping it. And the thing is, is that what it reminds me of is, you know, of Jesus Christ's birth. But they'll go on and say, well, the Bible, you know, you know, talks about the fact of them being evil and wicked. It talks, you know, it talks about these things. Well, let's see what the Bible has to say about trees, okay? Mainly, you know, because you know, aren't, uh, aren't uh, usually the trees that are brought into your house, aren't they pine trees or fir trees, right? Like the Douglas fir. That's what my mom always wanted. She always, every year, it was like she had to have a Douglas fir. I, d- I don't know why. I mean, you know, maybe she wanted a tree that she had, you know, was named. I-, I don't know. But let's see what it says. Look at Isaiah chapter 60. And we'll, we'll finally figure out if these wicked, evil, pagan trees what the Bible has to say about them. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 13. The Bible says, The glory of Lebanon shall come unto, uh, unto thee, the fir tree, the, uh, the pine tree, and the box together. To beautify the place of my sanctuary, I will make the place of my feet glorious. Wow, that sounds evil, doesn't it? No, what does God say? He says it's going to beautify the place of his sanctuary. They would actually bring in trees into the temple to decorate it. It's a matter of what you do with it that is the problem. The thing is, is that, yes, there were pagans maybe out there worshiping trees, like druids, they go out there and they hug a tree. We're not doing that. Our whole thing is, is you know, that we are worshiping the Savior, and we're remembering that he brought eternal life through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, number two. Should we celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah? You have people out there who say, well, you know what, we, we got to celebrate Hanukkah because Jesus was Jewish and all this other kind of stuff. All right. This will be a fun one. I said some some will say a Christian, you know, obviously being that pagan holiday, that you know, it's a horrible thing. Why? Because they'll say, you know, December twenty fifth was uh, the pagans celebrated the birth of Sol Invictus, their pagan god. Okay, or the winter solstice. 
So we should, since that's a pagan holiday, December 25th, we should celebrate Hanukkah because, uh, because Jesus was Jewish, and so we should celebrate that day, okay? So Hanukkah, you know, I'm going to give you some, you know, for, for some of us in here that don't know everything about, you know, besides the fact that it's a Jewish holiday, and there's a dreidel and a menorah, let's look at actually what it is. Hanukkah, this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. So I'm not, you know, this is not me just making this stuff up, okay? Hanukkah, the Jewish, is the Jewish holiday based, in, in, and I'm gonna, this is my part, sorry, is, it is based on a fable. It's based on a lie. And we'll get into the fact that the reason why it's based on a fable and a lie here of a supposed miracle of oil and a rededication of the temple. That's the reason why they celebrate it. And the reason why they celebrate it is because a foreign invader, came, uh, you know, supposedly came in, desecrated the temple, and Hanukkah is supposed to be the retelling of the rededication of the temple or the reconsecration of the temple after it was desecrated. Okay? So in other words, somebody came in and did stuff that they weren't supposed to do in the temple and made it unclean, so they had to go in there and rededicate it and, and do all these things. So let's go through. This, this right here is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, Hanukkah commemorates the Maccabean victories over uh, the forces of the Seleucid king, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and the rededication of the temple led by Matthias and his son Judas Maccabeus. The Maccabees were uh, the first uh, who fought to defend their religious belief rather than their lives. According to 1 Maccabees, do you see a problem already? There you go. I knew if I asked that question, I was you know, I, I, I almost, I, I sat there and I said, you know what, I know who's going to answer that question too. <laughs> because you know why? Because she's on top of it. All right. According to 1 Maccabees, a text of the, uh, of the Apocrypha, writings excluded from the Jewish canon, but included in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Old Testament canons, Antiochus had invaded uh, Judea, uh, tried to Hellenize the Jews, tried to make them more worldly, and desecrated the second, te- uh, the second temple in Jerusalem. Following the Jewish victory in a, in a three-year struggle against Antiochus, Judas, this, uh, uh, Mac- uh, Maccabeus, ordered the cleansing and the restoration of the temple. After it was purified, a new altar was installed and dedicated. Uh, Judas then proclaimed that the, de- uh, the de- dedication of, excuse me, the dedication of the restored temple should be celebrated every year for eight days, beginning on that day. In 2 Maccabees, the celebration is compared to the Feast of Sokoth, the Fe- uh, Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, which the Jews were unable to celebrate because of the invasion of Antiochus. Ha- uh, Hanukkah, therefore, emerged as a celebration of the dedication as the word itself suggests. suggests. Hanukkah lamp, or that menorah, uh, silver with, uh, with enamel inlays on, uh, the, uh, on the alloy, on a copper alloy. Although the, tradition, although the traditional practice of lighting candles at Hanukkah was not established in the book of Maccabees, the custom most likely started relatively early. The practice is enshrined in the Talmud, which uh, describes... Uh, describes the miracle of the oil in the temple. According to the Talmud, uh, when Judas Maccabeus entered the temple, he only found a small jar of oil that had, been, that had not been uh, defiled by Antiochus. The, the jar contained only enough oil to, uh, to burn for one day, but miraculously, the oil burned for eight days until new consecrated oil could be found, establishing the precedent that the festival should last eight days. So that's the miracle that they're looking at. Do you see any problems in this entire account? Miss Pat already brought up one of them. Is the fact of first and second Maccabees are in the Apocrypha. We don't have the Apocrypha. Why? Because it's not biblical and we're not going to believe it anyways. None of this is actually taken from the Bible. It's taken from first and second Maccabees, the Apocrypha, and the Talmud. Well, the Talmud teaches that Jesus Christ right now is burning in hell in his own excrement. So why should we believe that? We should believe what the Bible says. The Bible, for one thing, never teaches this at all. 
Never talks about the you know, rededication, never talks about Antiochus, you know, anything that's going in there in this whole oil thing and everything else that has happened. The other part is, did you notice that the, the Hanukkah lamp is, has, uh, that it's inlaid or it has um, uh, copper, uh, copper and silver overlays, which is what? They are doing the same thing as a founder. They're putting these things on top of that as well. The thing is, is that, um, and, they, and they say that they're praising God because he gave them back the temple. What did God do with that temple? He destroyed it. He caused it to be destroyed. So why would we ever celebrate the rededication of a temple in which God caused it to be destroyed in the first place? God got rid of it. Why? There was no need for it anymore. They were, they were using it for their own gain. God caused it to be destroyed in 70 A.D., and it's been gone for 2,000 years. And like I said, so why would we celebrate something that God caused to be destroyed? God wanted the temple to be destroyed. He said, well, why would God want it destroyed? Jesus Christ prophesied it, and it happened in 70 A.D. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, it says this, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And so this next part is the disciples going, hey, Let's check this out. Look at how beautiful the temple is. Look at how amazing it is. Look at it all of us in its glory. It says right here, it says, and Jesus, or sorry, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Look at how awesome this is. This is what Jesus said. He says, and Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall, uh, shall not be thrown down. That happened in 70 A.D. Where they're bobbing and weaving right now at that wall, with their curlicues going back and forth, that is not the temple. Why? Jesus said that every stone would be cast out, that there would not be one stone left upon another. So either they're, you know, they're telling the truth, or Jesus is telling the truth, or Jesus is lying, or they're lying. In which I know my God does not lie. Where they are worshiping right now is an old Roman fortress. Where they're bobbing back and forth like this. That is an old Roman fortress that they want you to believe is the, is the old temple foundation. But the Bible says that there's not one stone left upon another, so we know that's obviously not the temple. And that's, uh, that's the reason why we believe what the Bible says. Jesus didn't want the temple around anymore. Why? Because he came to save us, and now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So why would we need a building? Why would we sit there and, 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 and celebrate the rededica uh, rededication of a temple that Jesus wanted destroyed in the first place? Right? The next temple, because there is going to be another one, that next temple is going to be, uh, you know, the... the uh, the next temple that the Jews will get will be a sign of the end times when the Antichrist comes into, uh, into power, goes into that building, and declares that he is God. We don't need a temple anymore. We don't, you know, sacrifice animals. All of that, all of the, you know, the temple, the animal sacrifices, all of that is a, was a foreshadowing to show our need for Jesus Christ. The animals that were sacrificed never provided any kind of forgiveness. The book of Hebrews tells us that. It says that, the, uh, you know, that there was no remission of sin from the, uh, from the blood of bulls and goats. All of that was a foreshadowing. All of that God wanted you to realize, you need God. You need Jesus Christ. Because there are 613 Old Testament laws that you are supposed to keep and you cannot break. If and the Bible says that if you can keep all of those, which you can't, then you know what? Then you don't need Jesus. But it's kind of hard when one of the commandments is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So you kind of need to love, you know, uh, love the Lord, right? But he did all that. And the Bible says that if you offend in one point or you break any of those, at, at, at any time in your life, you are guilty of them all. God wanted you to realize that you need Jesus Christ and that you need to be clothed in his righteousness by doing what? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, by fully trusting in him to save you. 
That's what he wanted uh, us to realize. And here's another part, because we have other ones, we have other supposed Christians going around saying that, well, we needed to do the Old Testament feasts. That we need to keep their, you know, their high holidays a high holiday. What did I just read at the beginning in, uh, in Colossians chapter uh, 2, verse 16? It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or the, uh, of the new moon or the Sabbath days. Why? Because you know what? Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. We don't, have to, we don't keep those anymore. Why? Because God had done away, uh, done away with all those. Why? Because those were ceremonial laws and holidays and feasts. We don't keep those anymore. You can learn from them, but you don't keep them anymore. We're not Jewish. We're believers in Jesus Christ, amen? Because you go out and you have these, uh, you have these different groups of the Seventh-day Adventists. You have uh, you know, the, uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement. You have all these different ones. Jehovah's, Witness, Jehovah's Witnesses won't keep any holidays. You have Seventh-day Adventists. Saturday, that's when you're supposed to worship. Hebrew Roots, Saturday, that's when you're supposed to. Do you know the reason why we worship on Sunday? It's not decreed that we have to. But if you look at, you know, at, at what the Bible says, that's when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It was on a Sunday. So we say, you know what? We're going to commemorate, we're going to remember his, you know, the day, uh, you're going to worship him on the day that he rose from the day, uh, you know, dead. But you can worship Jesus any day of the week you want to. The Bible says not to make one day more special than the other. Because why? Because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen? The temple is completely irrelevant to Christianity, and so the, the celebrating of the rededication of the temple in which God caused it to be destroyed is irrelevant as well. We don't worry about that. We don't do all that. We celebrate this day. G uh, Christmas is... This is number three. Christmas is a time to reflect and celebrate the greatest gift given to us, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives us eternal life, right? That's the whole, that's the whole reason for the season, right? We celebrate, we reflect that great gift that God gave us, Jesus Christ. That while we're yet sinners, Christ still died for us. And we couldn't have that without the fact of Jesus Christ um, coming, you know, to save us. It is, time, uh, it is a time to spend with our family and our friends. It is a time we give gifts one to another, symbolizing that great gift of eternal life given to us, right? Luke chapter 2, verse 10 says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Why is it good tidings? Why is it great joy? Why do, why do people get excited around Christmas? It's not so they can go to Walmart or these other places, you know, so they can punch somebody in the face, so they can go get some new toy or whatever. The Christmas spirit right now is being hijacked by all the money-grubbing, greedy people out there that have to get the perfect gift for their kids. And the kids, let me, let me tell you this. If you do not get what you've always wanted on Christmas, which changes every year, it will be okay. It will be fine. Even if maybe, you know what, they say, you know what, in a couple of weeks we'll get you. Well, it's not Christmas. You know what? Most likely it'll be cheaper in a couple of weeks you know, after Christmas. And I never understood this, you know, the fact of, you know, that you know, parents want to attribute somebody else giving gifts instead of them to somebody else? You say, well, why is that? I don't know. I guess I'm kind of greedy in this thing. If I work and I put in overtime and I do all these things, shouldn't I be getting credit for the fact that I gave you a gift and not somebody else? I was kind of, you know, like I thought about that later on. I was like, man, all the times that you know, my parents got me all those gifts and whatever, and they never got credit for it. I'll just tell you that right now. but teach his own. It's time to remember, Christmas is a time to remember about the fact that the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. That the word of God, that Jesus Christ came and he dwelt among Can you imagine? The son of God who did not have to leave heaven 
did. Came down and dwelt among us to show us, hey, you know what? He does care. Because all other religions have this idea that there's a you know, God up there, and we're down here, and he don't care about us, that we got to do all these things so we can kind of you know, appease him and make, us, you know, and make him happy with us. That's not our Jesus. That's not our God. God said, you know what? They can't do it on their own. They're not going to be able to do enough good works to ever you know, warrant heaven. What they're going to need is me, and I'm going to come down to them so that way they can see that they need me. And you know what? I want to make it easy on them. I want to make it to where it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you, that you trust in me and not in yourself. Why do I say that? Because other religions teach that you've got to do enough good works, that you've got to do all these good deeds, and that hopefully at the end of, of that, that if you have enough good and it outweighs your bad, that somehow you get into heaven. Every religion teaches that, even false versions of Christianity. Because the false versions of Christianity will teach that you must repent of all of your sins in order to be saved. No one in this room, myself included, could ever repent of every single sin in my life. You know why? Because even the thought of foolishness is sin. How many stupid, foolish thoughts have I had? Probably quite a few. And, I, and it won't just stop today, just because I said that. Because you know what? It's, once you say that I can repent, I can turn away from all of my sins, it, who are you trusting in? If you say, I, am, I can turn away, it's not. People will say, well, no, it's Jesus because he's getting you. No, you're trusting in yourself to stop sinning. And you can't stop sinning because if you could stop sinning, then you wouldn't need Jesus. Right? But, God's, you know, but Jesus himself, you know, he, he tells us that if we would just put our full faith and our trust in him for save, you know, to save us, if we would do that, Simple, right? That we will be saved. Do you know how many times that we, you know, we go out and we tell people about Jesus Christ, I tell them that, that if you put your full faith and trust in them, you know what? How many doors we got slammed in our face because we told people that? And you see, it's so simple, it's so easy, but people reject it all the time. It's because it's almost like they want to be able to say they had a part in their salvation. That they did something to earn it. And the Bible says that it, it can't be earned. We don't deserve it. But God made a way. Amen? And as it says here, which shall be to all people, salvation for all was made possible because he came 2,000 years ago in the form of a baby. Right? Right? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit something that some of you in here might be shocked by. We don't really believe that Jesus Christ was born on December 25th, Christmas Day. Now, before you start getting your pitchforks and, ax, you know, and all that kind of stuff, start throwing stuff at me, we don't actually believe that Jesus was born on that day, right? Just like when we celebrate Easter, we don't actually believe, you know, that Jesus was crucified on that day. But there is a one in, six, uh, one in 365 chance that he was born on December 25th. <laughs> Whereas we don't know, you know exactly, but there is that one in 365 chance that he was born on that day. So we can, we can celebrate his virgin birth technically on whatever day we want. If you want to, you know, celebrate Christmas, and you're like, I don't want to, you know, have, you know, snow and all that other kind of stuff, or, you know, celebrate with anybody else, go celebrate in the summer. If you say you want to do it, I'll say, okay, have Christmas in July, you know. But we as Christians, like I said, don't believe that, we, uh, that he was born on December 25th, but we commemorate his birth on December 25th. Why? Because we know that he was born on a day. He was born, right? He was born on a day. We don't know what it is, but you know what? We said, you know what? We're going to take this day, and we're going to celebrate his birth, right? 
That's the reason why, you know, we say we, we commemorate it, we mark it, we observe it, we celebrate it. Why? Because of the fact that we want to celebrate it. You don't need the actual day in order to celebrate something. I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, of, you know, I know of a day that nobody else, I know of a day that our family treats very specially, which is May 13th. You go, what's May 13th? That is Forever Harding Day in our family. That is when myself, Alicia, and Lily, we all became a family that day. Do you celebrate it? No, but we do. We can commemorate, we can mark those days as being a special day, right? And we say, you know what, December 25th, we are going to celebrate the birth of our Savior. But what about those who argue, but Jesus, you know, uh, but we celebrate Jesus' birth on a day when pagans have designated that day for the celebration or the birth of their pagan god, their pagan Roman god, Sol Invictus. Simple. Our God is better. Our God trumps every other false God. Every false God. Psalm 135, verse 5 says, For I know that the Lord is great and that our God is above all gods. All believers know that false gods were never born on December 25th. You know why? Because angels and demons can't give birth. They're not real, they're false. Remember John 1.14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus did have, a, you know, he was born, you know, to a virgin on this earth. But for those that say, well, that's when Jesus came, and, you know, and that's when his existence started. No, Jesus has always been. He has always been, always, uh, always has been, always is, and always ever will be the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God, no matter what. Just because somebody says no, that's not true, does not change the fact that you know does not change the fact that that is the truth. So, if no other gods were born, because we know that no other gods can be born on that day, on December twenty fifth, there is a higher chance that Jesus Christ was born on December twenty fifth than any god, including Sol Invictus, was born on any day. Because they can't be born. As I said, because angels and demons are incapable of being born into uh, 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 physical human bodies. There is no God like our God. Amen? And to argue that we shouldn't celebrate Jesus on December 25th would be like saying that we shouldn't celebrate any day. Because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are all named after pagan Roman gods. Do you know that? Monday through, Sunday through Saturday, all those days are what? They were named after pagan gods. Saturday, Saturn. I could probably ask Abby and Charlotte, they would be able to tell me every single day that it is, whatever. Abby has that look on her face, she's like, please ask me, I want to do it. Um, so if we're not going to celebrate any day, then we shouldn't celebrate those days on those days because why? Because they're named after pagan Roman gods. Every day belongs to the Lord. Every day belongs to the Lord. Whatever you want to call it. Every day belongs to the Lord. We have the liberty to celebrate our Savior any day of the week, whether it be for His birth, His resurrection, or whatever. Romans chapter 14, verse 5 and 6 says this, one day, or sorry, one man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regarded, uh, regarded it unto the Lord. And, uh, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord doth he not regard it. In other words, you know what? If somebody says, you know what, I, I hold this day like we hold May 13th in high regard. You're not going to necessarily hold that day in high regard unless maybe it's your birthday, right? But we are fully persuaded that we are going to celebrate Forever Harding Day on May 13th, just like we're going to celebrate Christmas on De December 25th. 
most Christians, especially in America, esteem or set or value December 25th as the day to celebrate Jesus, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. And we regard it unto the Lord. So I'm going to leave you with this and we'll pray. As we celebrate Christ's birth and reflect with our own family, our friends, let us reflect upon the greatest gift that we have received, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen?